The Beer Hall Putsch became the Nazis' official birthday. And the groups had been electing Hitler their chairman, but grew tired of having to continually re-elect him. So they voted him in as the permanent chairman, and Hitler became the conscience of all the groups. The Nazi movement had begun as a health fad with peasant food and long hikes in the primeval forests and bathing at dawn in clear mountain streams. And they had bonfires on weekends and thrilling torchlight parades in the same tradition Nietzsche had enjoyed in his school days. People joined the Nazis because it was a lot of fun, waving flags and marching in parades with brass bands and singing at the top of their lungs. And they would dress up like old Greek gods or medieval knights, and they would play Wagner endlessly without ever getting tired of it. People were less interested in what Hitler had to say than how he said it, and in January of 1920 they'd given away free beer and free food in a restaurant called the Furstenfelder Hof, where they also held their meetings. And on the 24th of February in 1920, when Two thousand people had shown up to hear Hitler speak. A few ill-mannered louts had shouted at him from the audience, and they'd been dragged outside to the delight of the crowds. Responding to attacks during his speeches became standard entertainment at Hitler's rallies, and within the year there were meetings in all the surrounding cities, with ten times the number of members, and so many had also belonged to the German Hells Angels that soon the DAP became indistinguishable from the Free Corps militias. The written guidelines for the meetings were voted on until the same basic instructions applied to all the party groups, even though each group had its own steering committee, and a group of party groups was called a circle, and the flag had a swastika in a white party circle stamped over the red menace, and the swastika was the Norwegian symbol of the cross of St. Hans. The flag and their newspaper carried the Nazi message to anyone suffering the evil threat of global communism. And on the 24th of February in 1920, Hitler had made the rule that all foreigners, Jewish or otherwise, who had entered the fatherland after the 2nd of August in 1914, the day after the Great War had begun, must be deported. The Nazis admired Genghis Khan and had made him an honorary Nazi, even though they thought Mongolians were inferior. And the Nazi uniforms they came up with looked magnificent, with their great coats and detailed tailoring and intricate insignia shining proudly in the sun. Singing clubs were all the rage, especially in the beer halls where the entire crowd would spontaneously break into unstoppable song to which everyone knew the words, and singing while hiking easily transitioned into singing while marching. Hitler said what Germany needed was people of action, not just members sitting around in meetings talking and talking and talking. Party members went out and put flowers around everywhere as they marched around singing, and they made sure everything in sight was neat and clean, and they made up snappy slogans like, Be more than you ever dreamed. Take the big risk. Grab a great job. Your country needs your success. And plunge into productivity. Hitler's miracle had a lot to do with getting people's minds off their troubles and letting the economy take care of itself. And the Strength Through Joy Department loaded people onto buses and sent them on field trips or to attend free lectures. And the bus trips always included a musical portion of the program with rousing Nazi songs that everyone would join in to sing. Young and old held marches that always included flag-waving, and where more songs were sung, and mothers were kept busy at home sewing new Nazi uniforms so their children would fit in at school. And the demand for money dropped off pretty quickly when people found something better to do than chase prices. What convinced us at the time of National Socialism was the fact that it made new, better men out of the people we knew, 
There was the lazy bones who suddenly sacrificed his leisure time and holidays without receiving compensation. There was the beat-up, hospitalized S.A. who in his delirium yearned for his next performance of duty. There were miserly peasants who furnished potatoes, fat, and hams for the S.A. auxiliary kitchens. The Nazi Revolution, page 90. When asked what Hitler was talking about, people would insist he was going to save Germany, but they weren't even sure where Germany's borders were, or who qualified as a German, and they certainly couldn't decide what was the religion of Germany. So Hitler explained that Germans were those who spoke the language, and that made sense to just about everyone. Hitler cut back on his speeches because people had already memorized them. And it was always the same message, so Hitler spoke less often to stretch it out. Hitler had learned a lot about law enforcement from his admirers working in the administration of Landsberg prison while he'd been writing Mein Kampf. And in July of 1927, a revised edition of the book was published with the new edition, he formed an investigative and mediation committee to patrol and police the party members. Due to popular pressure and his willingness to monitor the Nazi movement internally, the government speaking ban was lifted in March of 1927, and Hitler was free to give speeches in public again without interference from government workers who sometimes felt at odds with Nazi policies. The party reopened their 8 p.m. meetings, and they sold little Nazi flags and copies of the newspaper in the back of the rooms. And Hitler would tell the membership to concentrate on working the program first, no matter what. And he said that fighting with the French groups or any other outside circles would hurt the party by distracting them from rooting out the enemies within their own membership. The result was that some were expelled for helping the Weimar government resist the French occupation of the Rhineland. Hitler was making enough money from sales of Mein Kampf to finance the Eagle's Nest and to pay for his supercharged six-seater convertible Mercedes, and people donated furniture to the Eagle's Nest and the Wagners gave him china and linens, and things were definitely looking up in Germany. Income had risen higher for Germans by 1928 than it had been before the Great War, and the Weimar government had expanded social programs, and with the communists out of business, unemployment was almost gone. Hitler's book stopped selling as much as before, since anyone who wanted one already had a copy and it cost three dollars while most books were half that much, and while 10,000 copies had been sold in 1925, people bought only 7,000 in 1926, and only 5,000 in 1927, then barely 3,000 in 1928. That year the Nazis won 12 seats in the Reichstag out of 491 in May of 1928, one of which went to Goering, and in the 1930 elections, after the stock market crash in America, the Nazis won 107 seats. Goering's wife would die of tuberculosis in October of 1931 while he was in Berlin with Hitler, and in 1932 the Nazis won 230 seats in Congress, making them far and away the largest party, and so it was their privilege to choose Goering as the president of the Reichstag. Britain had been ruling a quarter of the world in 1928, and British banks held all the financial capital. And the 1929 elections had given Nazis positions as mayors and many other offices in the cities, where they were able to make such rules as German children having to recite Nazi party slogans in their classrooms, and young German men between the age of 17 and 25 years old were given jobs as laborers and farmhands, and they were sent to live on farms or in work camps where they ate well, and they wore really great uniforms and made 
really great uniforms made in Germany, and as they worked, they would all start swaying together and break out in songs about the fatherland. Germans answered that though many bought Mein Kampf, few read it or much of it, and those who did assumed, plausibly enough, that its most radical utterances were never meant to be followed up by action. The Nazi Revolution, Ibid. France, Italy, and Belgium had been refusing to pay their debt to America, unless Germany paid them first. So America had been loaning money to Germany to allow them to pay France and Britain, and then these could pay America. But Britain had been objecting to America helping Germany. America wanted Germany to get back on its feet after the Great War, and had bought up German mortgages and lent money to German businesses, and when the American stock market crashed in October of 1929, both Germans and their American friends were denuded of funds for rebuilding Germany. Not just private banks, but the U.S. government had been lending money overseas to countries that were defaulting and the American Young Plan presented on the 31st of August in 1929 would be passed in 1930 to replace the previous arrangement of American banks helping Germany pay reparations to France and Britain. This, this new Young Plan opened a bank of international settlements in May of 1930 to take over the financing of Germany's debt and the BIS was opened with a loan from America. After the stock market crashed in October of 1929, President Herbert Hoover announced a suspension of reparations in June of 1931 that was approved by Congress in December, scrapping the Young Plan in hopes of bringing some sanity to the German economy. And Britain went off the gold standard, and France and Britain stopped making payments to America, since they weren't getting payments from Germany. A year later, when Hoover's moratorium expired in 1932, the three countries of France, Germany, and Britain met for a conference in Switzerland and told America there was no possibility of any more payments being made to the United States from their debts from the Great War. With the stock market crash of 1929, two-thirds of world trade had disappeared, and unemployment in Germany returned with a vengeance, and once again there were riots in the streets. German people would gather for no particular reason, and all hell would break loose with continual brawls and running street fights, and the British thought it was just like Germans to behave so poorly. When they marched off to the Great War, carefully tended businesses had been left behind, and those jobs were no longer there when they came home four years later. Every business had been more like a web of friendships where someone agreed to pay for something with a handshake and a promise, and a warehouse owner would carefully store a year's worth of work for his customers, then wait for them to bring the money and pick up the goods only to learn that the customer had gone off and gotten himself shot in the trenches. The problem had become impossible by the fact that inflation made the merchandise four times as expensive as the original customer had agreed, and so the workers in the warehouses were out of their jobs, and the people who catered to the workers lost their jobs, and the whole fabric of the German economy had been rent asunder. To add insult to injury, the Germans were being accused of deliberately destroying their economy in order to get out of paying reparations, and since Jewish bankers were said to have stabbed Germany in the back by arranging the Treaty of Versailles just as the Germans were winning the Great War, it stood to reason that Jews were also behind the spreading of these new ugly rumors. The newspapers had been telling the Germans that they were winning the Great War, and then they were told that the armistice would be fair and would bring peace. So Germans had stopped believing what they read in the newspapers, and they no longer trusted what they were told by their government. 
In the occupied Rhineland, the workers at Krupps had held a demonstration for better working conditions in March of 1923, and the French army fired at them and killed 13 people, and over half a million Germans had gone to the funeral. After the stock market crash in 1929, unemployment ticked up in Germany again, and two-thirds of party members were out of work, and in September of 1930, Nazis won almost 20% of the seats in the Reichstag, and when the stock market crashed again, everyone in Germany began to starve. Almost three million Germans were unemployed by December of 1931, and Germany started defaulting on reparation payments. And because things had been so bad in 1931, in the spring of 1932, the Nazis lost 34 seats and the Communists gained 11. And while the Nazis still had twice as many seats as the Communists, German business people panicked and stood strongly behind Hitler, as did the nobility, or what was left of them. Another election was scheduled in four months, and people who liked the Nazis wanted neither the nobility nor the communists, but someone more like themselves, a regular, ordinary man like Hitler. The presidential election in the spring of 1932 had gone to Hindenburg, who was offering security instead of Hitler's radical Nazi program and Hindenburg's government immediately banned political uniforms in Germany, and he also banned the SS and the stormtroopers. However, there were soon twice as many unemployed, and in the summer of 1932, the SS and the stormtroopers started a riot in Hamburg that they called Bloody Sunday, and the horse vessel song was being sung by the victors. Horst Vessel was a 22-year-old brown shirt who'd fallen in love with a girl named Erna, and she was a year older than Horst and had recently broken up with a 31-year-old who, communist whose nickname was Ali. The spurned Ali didn't want to end his love affair with Erna, and when she insisted, Ali called her a prostitute, and when Horst moved into Erna's apartment with her, the landlady tried to evict him because she liked the communists and missed Ali. The landlady was Ali's age, and the communist ex-boyfriend hated Erna for picking up with a young privileged German student, and on the 14th of February, Ali sent a dozen communists to murder Horst Vessel, who would linger in the hospital until the 23rd of February in 1930. The young communists and the young Nazis had loved to hate each other, and they engaged in territory battles like any young gang of thugs, but Horst's murder was taken up as a banner by the Nazis because Horst Vessel had been very active in the Nazi circles and was a favorite to many of the brown shirts. Horst had written a poem called Raise High the Flag, and the Nazis had set it to music, and the original words of the tune were and as your eye met mine, and as my lips kissed yours, then did love enshroud us. Putsy said that the music was like a Vienna cabaret song, and that the Nazis had, quote, hotted up the tune to march time, close quote. Adolf Hitler, Volume 1, page 249. When the police would show up to break up the fights between the youthful communists and the youthful Nazis, often they'd join forces and run away together, and both sides had once marched together to protest a ban on marching. The Nazis gave Horst Vessel a huge funeral, and Goebbels himself stood by the graveside to call the roll of the stormtroopers, and when it came time for Horst Vessel, they all shouted, Present! and they brought out the Nazi flag that had blood on it from the beer hall putsch, and thereafter members would swear the sacred oath to Hitler while grasping that blood-stained flag. The Horst Vessel song became the official anthem of the party, and while the young people had some fun with the gang fights, the older soldiers who'd been in the trenches of the Great War were deadly serious about it. 
on the 20th of July in 1932. General von Rundstedt declared martial law in Berlin, which was just what the Nazis needed to win votes, and elections at the end of the month were a stunning victory for them with almost 14 million popular votes and 230 seats in the Reichstag, and as well as well as and as well as being the largest party by far the nazis heralded over 1 million registered party members along with 400,000 ss and stormtroopers in august of 1932 after his landslide win in the elections hitler retreated to the eagle's nest to wait for a summons from berlin the next election in november failed to diminish the popularity of the Nazis, and on the 16th of December in 1932, a banker named Schroeder from Cologne asked the German government to appoint Hitler to something important to satisfy the Nazis, and so Hitler and some government officials were invited to come to the holy city of Cologne on the Rhine, right after the new year in 1933, where Schroeder told Hitler he would become chancellor if only he were willing to keep it a secret for now. Hitler had arrived in Cologne on a secret train, and so the Third Reich was quietly born there where the Magi were buried, in the largest reliquary in the Western world at Cologne's Roman Catholic Cathedral Church of St. Peter. The cathedral in Cologne had taken over 600 years to build, and when it was completed in 1880, it had been the tallest building in the world until the construction of the Washington Monument in America, and the cathedral in Cologne would take over a dozen direct hits during Hitler's war and would remain standing while the entire city was flattened. In 1933 in Cologne, the bankers and corporations gave Hitler money, but they made it a loan, and they wanted Hitler in power so they could get their money back, since the communists in Russia had defaulted and refused to pay back any of the loans made to the Tsar before they murdered him. Thus, the bankers and corporations were steadfastly behind Hitler, who also had the support of some very prominent British Jews, some of whom also happened to be in the banking business. Three million Englishmen had been unemployed in 1931, and the Crown had been unable to pay both unemployment and reparations to America, so they'd cut wages to the common Englishmen and decreased their benefits, and when this failed to improve the British economy, the Crown had gone off the gold standard. Britain had gone along with dismissing German reparations in 1932 in hopes that Germany could now afford to buy British goods. And when Hitler claimed credit for Germany's improved economic picture, that had gotten his party elected in the landslide. Two weeks after the meeting with Schroeder in Cologne, the Nazis had a big win in an election in Lippe on the 15th of January in 1933, the province that included Minden. After a whirlwind speaking tour by Hitler, and Hitler met with Hindenburg at Rippentrop's house in Berlin on the 10th, the 18th, and the 22nd of January, and the final meeting was kept most secret as Hindenburg and a friend and their wives went to the opera to hear Wagner, then snuck out the side door during the show to take a taxi to Ribbentrop's, and Hindenburg and his friend exited the taxi several blocks away and walked through the deep snow to make the meeting. By the 24th of January, they all agreed to make Hitler the Chancellor, and the announcement was made on the 30th of January, but it was supposed to be a coalition government and the Reichstag went up in flames on the 27th of February and was blamed on the communists. And the next day, an emergency order allowed Nazis to detain people in protective custody without cause. Most of the Nazis' opposition were either murdered or arrested by the 4th of March in 1933. 
and Hitler announced there would be new elections on the 5th of March, but the Nazis still did not win a majority of the popular votes and won a bare majority in the Reichstag. So they started arresting government officials and appointing Nazis in their place. And those they arrested were put into army barracks and warehouses surrounded by barbed wire, which was the beginning of the concentration camps. On the 21st of March, Hitler ordered the festival of Potsdam Day to celebrate what the Second Reich, to celebrate when the Second Reich had begun with Bismarck opening the Reichstag in 1871, and a ceremony was held in the church where Frederick II the Great and Frederick I called Barbarossa were buried. At the Treaty of Versailles in Frankfurt in 1871, France had lost Alsace-Lorraine, and France had been forced to pay a billion dollars to Germany, and German troops had stayed in France until they got their money. The former Kaiser had been listening to Hitler's speeches on the radio from his exile in Holland, and he sent a telegram to Hitler on Potsdam Day saying how proud he was of Hitler's good work. And three days later, the enabling law was passed in the Reichstag, and the Nazis called it the law for terminating the suffering of people and nation. The enabling law passed 441 to 94, but Hitler cheated to get that majority by making promises before the vote that he did not keep. And the enabling law made the provinces subject to the state, using the term Gleichrichter, which also meant an electrical rectifier, and Hitler made the Jewish boycott permanent on April Fool's Day. To replace the Communists' May Day commemoration, the Nazis held National Labor Day at the Tempelhof airfield, and everyone had the day off to make sure they attended, and 200,000 people were lit by 130 aircraft searchlights, and the eagle at the top of the stadium had a 100-foot wingspan. The rally was so well organized that everyone knew exactly what to do and where to eat and sleep, and the crowd cheered and watched fireworks, and the next day all union leaders were arrested and their newspapers were shut down and their bank accounts were seized, and the rioting and sabotage that followed was not done by Nazis or by communists, but by union bosses wanting to get their jobs back. People had been disappearing into basements of police stations, and by July all the labor unions and the unapproved newspapers and any other political party were made illegal. By November of 1933, the Reichstag was 95.2% Nazis, and the first thing they did was appoint Fritz Tote as the Todt. Fritz Tote. T-O-D-T, as the Inspector General of German Roadways to begin building the Audubon, and that project was quickly followed by a plan to fortify the West Wall to keep out the perfidious Brits and their hapless allies. President Hindenburg died in August of 1934, and Hitler joined the office of the Chancellery with that of the Presidency to become Germany's sole holy leader, and a national referendum on the 19th of August confirmed that the Germans wanted Hitler to be their blessed Führer. In Germany, even teachers were civil servants, and all civil servants had to take the Nazi oath or lose their jobs, and Hitler banned the book All Quiet on the Western Front, so young Germans wouldn't think war was bad. Germany had been blamed for the Great War and was told to pay for all the damage done, and Poland, France, and Belgium had been given some German land in the aftermath, and Britain had screwed with the Treaty of Versailles to keep France from getting ahead and didn't want France to get enough money from Germany to buy military equipment that could be used to invade England. While Germany was supposed to be paying France, the British were insisting the Germans pay France in goods rather than in gold, 
and when Germany failed to send the agreed amount of lumber to France in September of 1922, the Americans pulled out of the Rhineland and allowed the French to march in, and the German workers in the Rhineland went out on strike. Business under the British model had slowed to a crawl, and historically the Crown of England survived by owning land all over the world and selling titles to rich noble offspring willing to relocate and pay a substantial price for the land, and then funnel taxes back towards the Crown. English who'd bought some small country like New Hampshire or New York would then charge taxes to the locals and keep a little for themselves before sending the lion's share back home to the crown. The American colonists had not only been taxed by their titled landlords, but were paying an English tax every time merchants traded with the home country, and the British crown would keep its overseas nobles honest by refusing to send troops to protect these English nobles whenever the locals protested paying too high taxes imposed by the landlords. The large English estates in America were not wealthy enough to afford their own police forces, and the crown in 1770 had simply been overextended because of its conflict with France and could not offer the British American colonies much help. When Napoleon tried to bring democracy to Europe, England was left as the only country with enough money to lend after the Napoleonic Wars failed to liberate Europe from its nobility leaving destruction in its wake, and while the Crown Bank was actually owned by the King of England, in America the Founding Fathers had decided that the King should not own the country, but that private individuals must be free to own their papers and possessions inviolate from the King. Americans believed the use of a common currency in compliance with common laws was better than rule by whim of an often insane king or by his appointed agents, and America decided that the rule of the law of the marketplace, along with an equal right to use the currency, would guide the American path to prosperity. In early America, when taxes had become too high, the Americans simply refused to pay and so the crown had declared war on them. Half of England had a soft spot in their hearts for the Americans, if only to admire them for standing up for themselves like good Englishmen, and King George assumed the Americans had spent too much time away from civilization, and so he commanded that the Americans be treated like the rest of the savages under colonial rule, and ordered his British troops to fire at will upon the Americans. The colonists had taken sides, and were split between support for the English crown because they were decent Englishmen, or wanting to fight for freedom. And when the crown hired German soldiers to fight the Americans, the tide turned against Britain. Frederick II the Great was in power in Germany from 1740 to 1786, at the same time America was finding its independence. And there were so many Americans of German descent that hiring their brethren to fight the Crown's wars had been the final insult to the colonists. The language of American English was born as soon as the Crown no longer had the authority to burn books printed in the U.S. just because they didn't like what was said in them. And an American newspaperman had been put on trial in an English court in 1735 for printing bad things about the governor of New York, but an American jury had set him free on the grounds that he'd told the truth. Benjamin Franklin became the voice of America by putting Americans' opinions into print. And he wrote Poor Richard's Almanac that anyone could read because it was in the style and language of the common people, and Franklin also invented the Pennsylvania fireplace that circulated warm air back into the room, but he refused to patent it as a gift for the good of humanity. George Washington 
had suffered the smallpox and was scarred for life, and Washington hadn't gone to school in England like all the other rich American plantation owners, and so he was a free thinker who believed in an independent federal American republic. George Washington gathered an army of his own, dressed them in better blue than the English red, and asked the U.S. Congress to either support the war effort or side with the British crown, and by a single vote the U.S. Congress supported George Washington's army. The books Thomas Jefferson had been reading told him basically three things. That people were fundamentally good, given the opportunity, and that government was contractual, meaning that it was based on the consent of the governed. The main difference between America and Britain was that the Founding Fathers believed that God gave people inalienable rights that could not be abridged or amended by government, while Britain believed that God had given them a king, and Jefferson also thought, thirdly, that God was more scientific than not. The British governor had been a pushover, because when the Americans didn't like what he was doing, they would tell him they couldn't pay his salary. The British King George III wanted to charge America a stiff fee for saving the colonies from the French. But the Americans said they'd rather fight the French themselves than have to pay England. And America had no quarrel with France, while Benedict Arnold would become a traitor because he hated the French. The British Empire had grown by private English charter companies sailing forth to seek their fortune, where they often ran into Frenchmen. And the British charter companies would build colonies, not as the result of military excursions, which the British often lost, but by licensed companies who would sally forth to set up shop, and then the British military would come later to build forts to protect them because taxes paid by the charter companies were considerably larger than the taxes that could be squeezed out of the common English workingmen. With this blueprint, British mercantilism became the standard for the empire, and the charter companies that were creating colonies needed in turn to borrow money to stay in business because they often failed to turn a profit due to high overhead and the ever-present danger of pirates and other barbarians living around the seven seas. If the colonies were extinguished, there would be no taxes coming back to the crown. So sending British soldiers to protect the charter companies and their employees was a lucrative and mutually beneficent, beneficent enterprise for the Crown. The American Founding Fathers wanted to tax commerce, not farms, and when America started an income tax in 1861, the South was angered because only those with an income over $800 were taxed at 3% rising to a 10% tax on incomes over $10,000, so the lion's share of taxes would come from plantation owners, not from the northern factory workers. London survived by the banking business, and being able to borrow from the Bank of England was preferred to borrowing from an international bank, because the British military was in the business of protecting its currency in all its far-flung realms, and English merchants would borrow capital to sail forth, or not borrow but acquire it along the way, and when price-fixing or tariffs interfered heavily with private trade, the crown would become the sole buyer and seller in the market, and that monopoly could be enforced on the high seas by the Royal Navy. Germany could not sail to the Atlantic from the port of Danzig because Denmark sat in the way, and the Danish straits were too easy for the Royal Navy to blockade. So from Hanover on the western side of Denmark, the Germans had built a series of canals that led right through from the Baltic Sea to the North Sea, joining Germany's port of Danzig to the Atlantic Ocean. The main canal that was enlarged into the Kaiser Kiel Canal, cutting through the base of Denmark, was fed by the Elbe River, 
So whoever controlled Hanover could control Germany, and that's why the House of Hanover had been created in 1707. The French had invaded Hanover during the Seven Years' War in 1763, but the British had driven them out, and during the Napo Napoleonic Wars, Hanover had again been occupied by the French, and the nobility of Hanover had fled to London to conspire with Prussia and Austria, even though Britain had been at war with these Germans at the time. From London, the Hanoverians formed an army called the King's German Legion so they could fight Napoleon, and these Germans would play a major role in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Vienna had become the Constantinople of the North, and after the Napoleonic Wars, the Congress of Vienna in 1814 was the first global trade convention held in Vienna that was at the crossroads of the marketplace where the Danube River ran out into the plains. Paris was no longer the center of the universe by 1814, having gained its former glory due to the great Roman roads radiating outward from the city towards all the capitals and ports of Europe. And after Napoleon tried to bring democracy to the world, Britain sat out the Congress of Vienna, and their refusal to participate allowed the British to spend the following Victorian century without having to pay for the Napoleonic Wars. Queen Victoria would live until January of 1901, and the national debt of Britain in 1815 had been nine times what it had cost to fight the American War of Independence. The Crimean adventure would not be very expensive because France was made to pay the lion's share of the bill, and the Crimean War was necessary cover for Britain's quelling of the Indian mutiny in the British East India Company's poppy plantations. If Britain were, al were allied with France in the Crimea to fight Russia to keep the Tsar from interfering in the opium trade, then as British allies the French would not be able to meddle in what was now British India after the Carnatic Wars had ended in France's defeat. The British had a terrible time trying to teach the Indians in India to enforce military rank because of their religious caste system, and the British sent tens of thousands of soldiers as part of the Crimean deployment taking India away from the East India Company, and Victoria would give railroads to the Indians, and they would call her queen. Victoria gave her navy the ability to protect the currency, rather than merely saving East India Company employees. And under Victoria, the Royal Navy perfected gunboat diplomacy, while before, under Virgin Queen Elizabeth, the English ships had operated mostly as private pirates. Victoria regulated the charter companies by granting or withholding licenses in order to protect the British pound sterling, and the Royal Navy was now in the business of regulating trade, and its payroll was increased to include the food and accommodations of military officials and officers living on deserted islands. The Royal Navy became a protection racket that would stay in port only so long as the local companies paid enough to shore them up. So when the Japanese started moving onto islands in the Pacific in the 1930s, where the British had built outposts, they found only a family or two manning these stations because the British Empire in the 30s was operating on the cheap. On board a Royal Navy ship a few good years ago, a good few years ago in the North Atlantic in winter, somebody remarked in a casual conversation, Nobody at home has any real idea of what the Navy does in peacetime. When visitors come on board, they drink whatever's going, usually in the mistaken belief that it's paid for by the taxpayer, and think we spend our time in a round of cocktail parties with a bit of gentle cruising in between. The decline of British sea power by Desmond Wettern 
London Jane's Publishing Company Limited, 1982, in Introduction. The Japanese invaded China in 1931 to stop Chinese workers from striking in British and Japanese factories, and labor unions operated on the market principle that if there were a monopoly on labor, the unions could demand decent wages, but the company owners had a different view. The magnates had a rationale for their low-wage policy. If the men were paid more, they said, they would only waste more of their wages on whiskey, beer, tobacco, gambling, and painted ladies. The Rockefeller Syndrome by Ferdinand Lundberg, New York Kensington Publishing Company, 1975, page 179. Tax evasion in England was a passionate quest in the sporting culture of the fox-hunting classes, and British royalty believed it to be their duty to look after the coal miners and the English peasants because the servants and the darkies and the women were dependent on the good grace of these overlords. So with true good intentions, the crown system believed that the common people could not govern themselves, that overlordship was a necessary fact of life in the best interests of their dependents. The French had been governing themselves well enough, ever since they'd chopped off Marie Antoinette's head, while across the Channel the system of class separation in England was made obvious in the polarization of the House of Lords against the House of Commons, a separation too entrenched in Britain for any hope of change, short of some global conflagration, which was shortly to be visited upon them. Britain had imagined America going communist after the Great War because of America's lack of respect for the nobility's born-to-rule system. And England had been on the verge of civil war in 1914 over the Irish Home Rule Bill the labor strikes, and women being arrested for demanding the right to vote. The Great War would save Britain from civil war on the home front, and with the Treaty of Versailles ending the Great War, there was only the King of England left, along with the Queen of Holland and the Kings of Belgium and Greece, with three other kings in Scandinavia from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and while there were the kings of Monaco and Luxembourg and Liechtenstein, these would fit into a suburb of Philadelphia. The king of England was in a class all by himself, ruling a quarter of the world with London as the financial capital of it all. When the Kaiser was forced to abdicate at the end of the Great War, the German Second Reich that had started in 1871 ended at the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, and the Allies made the new socialist German government at Weimar sign the peace treaty instead of the defeated Kaiser. When the Weimar socialists failed to make the German economy work, the British told America they simply couldn't pay what was owed to the United States unless their trade routes from India were secure, and Winston Churchill was determined to overrule Italy and keep the Italians in Libya from interfering with Britain's sea lanes to India through the Suez Canal. America was about the free market, and the marketplace was where anonymous people could come to buy anonymous commodities, and if it's on the table, it's for sale. If the seller discriminated against buyers or refused service to a paying customer, the marketplace would break into a riot and that would wipe out all the sellers. The American way of business was diametrically opposed to the way of the nobility and rather than, quote, knowing one's place, close quote, and, quote, maintaining the stability of the social order, close quote, Business in America was all about upward social mobility, and in America, the customer was king. The American government was in the business of making commerce possible, while European governments were the commerce, and top-down governments like European royal houses tried to control access to the market or strove to set prices, and they attempted to limit or expand the amount of money printed 
or they wished to set a minimum wage or put a heavy tax on profits, but the law of the market followed the fact that two traders would always do the best deal in their respective favors. The law of supply and demand made the American marketplace self-leveling, while royal families living overseas needed to look out for their own selves before they could worry about the people over whom they ruled. The American War of Independence had been based on the idea that nobody was any better than anybody else, and that government must be by consent, not by force and the Americans believed that voting was the only fair means to discover consent. Transparency gave voters the opportunity to police the elected, and while voting was never easy, the voters themselves fought to make it fair, lest any side be seen as cheating, and the early Americans had no police, so they relied on each other to enforce the rules. All the states in early America printed their own money, and the new American government did not demand that the states pay taxes, but asked for donations. And because most states, especially the South, refused to give, the Treasury came up with money elsewhere, especially from a few rich Dutch Jews who donated money to the U.S. government, which was a good thing because at the time one-third of Americans still wanted to remain British, and those were mostly the ones with money. In 1789, eighty million dollars worth of U.S. bonds were sold to pay for the war against Britain, while Napoleon was bringing democracy to Europe, and when the Russians beat the French, putting an end to Napoleon, America would be good for its debts up until the New Deal was put in place in 1935 that was too near socialism for the bankers, and they responded with a capital strike that FDR would blame for the slow recovery from the Depression, although he could never prove it. Banking was all about making money lending money and many bankers at the time just happened to be Jewish, since they'd been banned for centuries from all other, quote, noble professions, close quote, while money handling had been considered a dirty, grubby job relegated to Jews, and Nazi propaganda played up the greedy Jew theme, while Hitler used Jew bashing as an economic plan to bring prosperity back to Germany by stealing from the rich and giving to the common Germans, which was socialism at its best. Stealing from Jews was intended as payback for the crime done to the fatherland in the Treaty of Versailles, written by Jewish bankers, but unfortunately for Germany, the Jews did not have as much money as they had been rumored to have had. Banking was also about shipping, and in the 30s, the price of shipping in England had been falling too low to keep British shipyards in business as the result of too much foreign competition from France and Germany. So mystery submarines began sinking selected ships, either to collect the insurance or to make work for British shipyards needed to build replacements. Because the British were too busy building replacement ships, the Royal Navy said no British could help the Americans land in France in 1942 or 1943, but that Americans could come fight with the British in North Africa and especially help them in the Balkans. So FDR invited Mr. Higgins to come to Washington, D.C. for a fireside chat since FDR knew better than to allow any British to land troops in the Balkans. The Royal Navy had four board lords and a chairman, who would disclose an operation to the other board lords only on the day it was put into action, plans sometimes cooked up while waiting for breakfast. And when Hitler was getting Germany back on its feet, the second board lord was Lord Mountbatten, and the third board lord was married to a Chicago millionaire with easy access to American opinion, who would convince the captains of American industry that Hitler's war was winding down right after D-Day, 
And as she told the Americans, and she told the Americans to stop making any more guns or bullets, and that would contribute to the shortages suffered by American troops right before the Battle of the Bulge. Just as the Americans were desperate for more ammo in the fall of 1944, they would have to get more bullets from England and pay English ships to bring it to them, since all the boats America could muster would be busy fighting the Japanese in the Pacific Ocean. In August of 1914, Congress wanted to buy or order ships built in England and wrote a bill that passed the House on the 17th of February in 1915. But the Senate stalled the bill by seizing the floor and reading the long version of a newspaper, and they slept in the hallway to keep the discussion on the motion going until it failed on the 4th of March, when the Senate term expired. They all went home without voting, and when they came back, the bill was revised to include the U.S. shipping board that ordered $12 million worth of ships built with an eye towards American investment, and by the end of the Great War, the U.S. would own almost $3 billion worth of ships. The Americans figured out that if the British were forced to keep up its own navy, they would be able to protect themselves instead of having to ask the Americans to come over to save them again. And on the 18th of June in 1935, the English-German naval agreement was signed that went a long way towards upping the budget for the Royal Navy. The Bismarck was launched in February of 1940, but was unable to break the British blockade of the Danish Straits and on the 26th of May in 1941, the Bismarck was hit by 16 British Ferry Swordfish biplane torpedo bombers, and she sank, taking over 2,000 German sailors to their death. With the sinking of the Bismarck, it had been shown that the oversized dreadnought warships were sitting ducks for aerial attack by the RAF, and to keep some prestige alive for the Royal Navy, the Bismarck's sister ship, the Tirpitz, was allowed to stay afloat until the 12th of November in 1944, when the British sent 32 Lancaster bombers to sink her, killing a thousand German sailors on board the Tirpitz. Much of what had gone on with the board lords of the Royal Navy was something of a gentleman's game. And before Hitler's war, the German nobility dedicated themselves to giving dinner parties to foreign visitors in an attempt to rehabilitate Germany after the Great War. And the Germans entertained people like Charles Lindbergh and Edward VIII and his girlfriend Wallace Simpson. And the more Germany became Nazi, the more dinner parties were held to show how successful the Nazis were. Most of the dinners came from funds recently liberated from Jewish bank accounts and were held at estates recently owned by Jewish families. And the German hosts printed up menu cards before they knew the location of all the bathrooms. And as Hitler's war was ending, Advanced squads of British spies were sent ahead to ensure that those dinner party guest lists were destroyed. Although Hitler never managed to fit in with the nobility, most of his generals were of that class who regularly practiced dueling, and most of gen Hitler's generals sported a dueling scar. Hitler went to the opera with all the Nazi leaders, to hear Wagner at the summer festival at Bayreuth on the 22nd of July in 1936, and there they pledged to help Franco keep the British out of Spain, believing it to be an easy call because Edward VIII had just become the King of England and Edward would be forced to abdicate that December. But... <sighs> Although Hitler never managed to fit in with the nobility, most of his generals were of that class who regularly practiced dueling, and most of Hitler's generals sported a dueling scar. 
Hitler went to the opera with all the Nazi leaders to hear Wagner at the summer festival at Bayreuth on the 22nd of July in 1936, and there they pledged to help Franco keep the British out of Spain, believing it to be an easy call, because Edward VIII had become the King of England, but Edward would be forced to abdicate that December. The Communists had won the election in February of 1936 in Spain, and General Franco declared war on the Spanish, and the world eagerly read about the ensuing Spanish Civil War where thousands came to join in the liberation of the working class from the old nobility in good old fascist Catholic Spain. Journalists and fifth columnists spent 1936 learning to shoot and to smuggle food and weapons and to write newspaper articles full of propaganda, and the Germans bombed Guernica on the 26th of April in 1937, using eight successive waves of planes that killed 1,600 people. And to make sure the new scientific aerial bombing was successful, mysterious widespread dynamiting on the ground set fire to what was left of the town. Guernica was the first use of aerial bombardment and the British tried to say it was an ineffective, inaccurate, and inhuman method of conducting warfare. But it worked quite well, as the opponents quickly surrendered to each other, leaving the third combatant, Franco, in control of Spain. For the rest of 1938, the former communist and royalist combatants joined forces against Franco and left hundreds of thousands dead until Hitler loaned Franco some tanks. And on the 27th of February in 1939, Britain would recognize Franco's government. Edward VIII had become the King of England in January of 1936, less than four months after the Nuremberg Laws were put in place in Germany in 1935, and the world was set abuzz about Edward VIII's relationship with the divorced American named Wallace Simpson, and everyone took sides while newspapers flew off the shelves. The month after Edward VIII became king, the Communists won the election in Spain because romance had been in the air and if a commoner like Wallace could win the heart of the Prince of Wales, then it seemed to ordinary people that the communists in Spain could vote themselves into the palace. Wallace had been married to an American Navy pilot when she was twenty years old, and her husband had been eight years her senior. And before they were married for one year, he left her for a former girlfriend, but Wallace went back to him for another five years, and then left him again after he locked her in the bathroom overnight. When Wallace's husband was sent to Hong Kong by the Navy, she joined him in Hong Kong to see if he had changed, and she went with him to many opium dens and to houses of prostitution, and Wallace found a job in one of them as a hostess. Wallace would go out on the town after work, and she bought a lot of jade. And Wallace took the train to visit her friends in Peking, and lived with them for almost a year, during which time she had an affair with Mussolini's son-in-law, who was the Italian ambassador, and she also dated the ambassador from Argentina. Wallace contracted a venereal disease and sailed back to America and checked into a hospital in Seattle. And then she divorced her husband, and the following year, Wallace married a man with some money whose father was a British Jew. Her new husband was a partner in a company that bought and sold ships, and he had changed his name from Solomon to Simpson so he could do business in Germany and in Italy. And Wallace's new husband was an American, but spent half his time on vacation in Europe. Mr. Simpson had moved to Britain in 1918 after quitting Harvard in order to join the British Army, 
And Mr. Simpson was already married when he'd started up with Wallace, and he had a three-year-old child. And after Mr. Simpson divorced his wife in 1926, Wallace got to wear all her clothes. With her improved situation, Wallace hired an interior decorator who was the wife of the writer Somerset Mom. And Wallace had a chauffeur and a cook and three maids living in. The Simpsons hosted continual dinner parties, and when the stock market crashed in 1929, Mr. Simpson lost all his American money, but did well selling ships to Germans, Italians, and Scandinavians. Wallace and her husband moved to London, and two years later she met the Prince of Wales at a dinner party, and Wallace got Edward's attention by talking down to him, something no one else would have dared. She'd been reading about Edward in the newspapers for years, and he was famous for riding hunting horses too fast and falling off them and scaring everyone. And Wallace and Edward would meet at hundreds of dinner parties over the next few years, and Edward took Wallace on vacations, sometimes sailing around in the Mediterranean. Edward gave her jewelry and clothes and let her order his servants around, and most of the time Wallace brought her husband along to keep up appearances, and in the summer of 1935 Mr. Simpson began an affair with Wallace's best friend, but they all kept going to the same parties, and Wallace continued to live in Mr. Simpson's house. On the 19th of January, in 1936, the King of England lay dying. But it was late at night, and if George V lived through the night, the news of his death would not make the morning newspapers. So his doctor injected him with a gram of cocaine and a gram of morphine to finish him off, and Edward VIII became the King of England, and that news made the morning paper. Nine months later, Wallace filed for divorce from her husband in October of 1936, and Wallace's divorce became final six months after that, leaving her free to marry Edward VIII on his father's birthday in 1937, and the newlyweds went to a Nazi castle in Austria for their honeymoon. The Nazis had their best year in 1935 and Germany reached its zenith in the summer of 1936 when they hosted the Olympic Games, and then Italy joined the Reich in October, followed by Japan in November. And Churchill told Hitler that the Americans would support Britain in a war, but Hitler didn't believe it. After all, the enthusiasm he'd seen from the Americans at the Olympics in Berlin. The new king of England, Edward VIII, was a big fan of Hitler, and Edward VIII's mother had been born in Germany, and the Kaiser was his father's cousin, so Edward VIII called the Kaiser Uncle Willie, and Edward had once sailed to America on one of the Kaiser's ships. Wallace and Edward had many German friends, some of whom wore Nazi uniforms and Edward spoke fluent German since he'd spent much of his childhood in Germany. The British King George I and George II had also been Germans, and it was not until George III that England again had a king born in England who spoke the English language as their first tongue, even though there was not a drop of English or Welsh or Scottish blood in him. Edward VIII had been sent to fight in the Great War and had been horrified by it, and he wanted no more war with Germany. And when Edward VIII took Wallace to Germany to meet Hitler, they stayed in a Nazi mansion and that had previously belonged to a Jewish banker. Wallace thought the new owner was a bad drunk, even though they had a wonderful afternoon with Hitler, and the British newspapers had to edit out all the times Edward VIII gave the Nazi salute. The Germans sent red roses to Wallace every day after the two lovers had returned to England, but British intelligence knew that every state secret told to Edward VIII ended up in Germany right away, so the British sent Edward off to be the governor of the Bahamas, to keep him out of trouble, 
just as soon as they could convince Edward to abdicate the throne. Meanwhile, in America, the Golden Gate Bridge was almost ready to open for traffic from San Francisco to the Marin Headlands, and the city-side tower of the Golden Gate Bridge had been started in 1933, and it was painted Dulux International Orange because that matched the original red lead protective paint from the factory, and for that specific color the price was right. The water under the bridge was 370 feet deep, so they built anchorages that were man-made islands going down to bedrock over 100 feet deep with holes in the ocean floor blasted by deep-sea divers. And the concrete poured into them was made out of oyster shells from the bay. During construction, a ship accidentally rammed one of the man-made islands and destroyed it, so they rebuilt it, and then the island was wrecked by a storm and was rebuilt again, while hundreds of men waited on either side of the bridge, watching for anyone to fall or quit, in hopes of an opportunity to sign on with the job. When the final cable was attached, the pole on either side of the bridge was as much as 1,000 railroad engines and the uprights were as tall as sixty-story buildings held together with over twelve hundred thousand rivets, and the scaffolding on the bridge had been made out of ten-foot pieces of redwood because it was so cheap and plentiful. The uprights would bend a little in the wind, going back and forth a couple of feet, and for the roadbed, huge plates from Bethlehem steel were fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle and had been delivered on Bethlehem's own ships by sailing through the Panama Canal. The Golden Gate Bridge was the first construction project to require safety helmets, and the last piece was fitted after the sun had warmed the iron enough for it to slide into place at 4.25 p.m. on the 18th of November in 1936. After final completion of the Golden Gate Bridge on the 27th of May in 1937, it took three days to celebrate the opening, and the following week on the 3rd of June in 1937, Wallace and Edward were married in France, and Hitler sent them an inscribed gold box for their wedding. Wallace and Edward would sail for the Bahamas on the American liner Excalibur, on the 1st of August in 1940, and the Bahamas were a mere 60 miles outside of America, just east of the coast of Florida. The Bahamas form a chain of beautiful semi-tropical islands that have a charming atmosphere and some of the finest beaches and sea bathing anywhere. Nassau, the most sophisticated and modern of the resorts in the Bahamas, is quaintly British, decorous, and utterly lovely. Spend your days basking on the beaches and browsing in the marvelous shops. Spend your evenings dancing at Nassau's famed resort hotels, later making the rounds of the native nightclubs and cabarets. Nassau offers its visitor visitors a royal welcome and goes all out to give them a wonderful time. Pan Am's new guide to the Caribbean, Central America and South America, the USA and Canada, Part 2, paperback edition of New Horizons World Guide, Geneva, Switzerland, Nagel Publishers, page 133. No date, but cigarettes were sold in the U.S. for from 50 to 60 cents a pack when it was printed. The principal fighting game fish are amberjack, barracuda, bonefish, bonito, dolphin, grouper, jack, kingfish, mackerel, mako, blue marlin, white marlin, permit, sailfish, shark, snapper, tarpon, albacore tuna, allison tuna, parenthesis, the mighty bluefin tuna, which runs off Bimedian cat K each May and June, close parenthesis, and the fighting wahoo, a game fish which pound for pound puts up the scrappiest fight of any fish. Pan Am's New Guide, page 137. Hitler depended on England being his friend, and on Edward VIII being their king. 
So the abdication on the 9th of December in 1936 was not good news. And when Edward VIII went on the radio to tell the world he was giving up the throne for love, Edward became the first English king to ever relinquish the throne voluntarily, but Hitler assumed he'd been forced to quit. The day Edward sailed for the Bahamas, Hitler started bombing Britain, and three months before, on the day the Germans had marched into France on the 10th of May in 1940, Churchill had become the first Lord of the Admiralty, and Hitler was especially eager to get the Japanese on his side because Japan had been allied with Churchill's Royal Navy during the Great War. Japan had helped the British patrol the oceans of Southeast Asia, and while Edward stayed in the Bahamas to build gambling casinos with his new American mafia friends who had become rich running prohibition liquor to and from the islands. Hitler allied with the Japanese the month after Edward and Wallace landed in the Bahamas in August of 1940. The Axis powers were formed on the 27th of September in 1940 with the signing of the Tripartite Pact and Wallace's old boyfriend Count Ciano, who had by now become Mussolini's son-in-law, signed for Italy. The Japanese had built a sizable naval fleet in accordance with the Washington Naval Conference of 1922 that mandated a ratio of five to five to three warships between America, England, and Japan. And at the time, Japan owned both Taiwan and Korea. When Japan invaded Manchuria in September of 1931, the British had helped the Japanese with intelligence, saying they had to keep the Russian Jew communists <clears throat> from taking over British interests in China, specifically needing Japanese help to quash the unrest from Chinese striking in British factories, and for the invasion, Japan sent a massive amount of opium into Manchuria before landing Japanese troops in 1931. Britain was playing for empire and had been practicing this sort of thing for centuries, and Pearl Harbor would keep the Americans from having much to say about the course of the war. <laughs> 